All right, let's get started here, and we're going to begin to talk about now the doctrine of inspiration, okay? And as we begin to discuss the issues of inspiration, and I didn't get a chance to clean this off, which is fine, when we begin to talk about the issue of inspiration, then there are some theories about inspiration that you just I just want you aware of them because you hear them, people just don't call them this. If I said we're going to study eschatology, would you know what I was talking about? Some of you would, but the majority don't. What am I talking about? The future time. Well, that's a theology book. That's a theology, but so people aren't, if I said to you we're going to talk about the plenary verbal inspiration theory, you'd go, huh? Well, but that's what that's what you believe in. That's the formal name of it, something like that. Okay, but see the so you you hear people, they don't use these names, but they'll use the ideas and the thought pattern. Okay, so I want you to, just to be familiar with them as we as we introduce the the subject matter on inspiration. And again, revelation and inspiration are complete; they're done. And we have to have that in our thinking as we begin to study this and as we begin to talk about now the doctrine on, of inspiration. So we're just going to enter, we're just getting it going here, okay? I got you for 50 minutes till noon or a little beyond, just getting you going, all right? Okay, I'm setting you up as right, all right? There are various. And studies and viewpoint that come out of theology that you scratch your head and you go, oh my goodness, no wonder man is confused. But they come from the tactics. And I spelled it, there's a C in there, so get the spelling right, okay? But there, thank you. But there are, they, th these things come from this list of tactics because it's been ingrained in man since day one or day three, however after the fact. The first, the first one in inspiration, the idea out there, is what is called the natural view. Okay? And the natural view, if I said to you that listening to John Madden give a halftime speech in the Super Bowl inspired me. What did it do to me? It got me all excited, didn't it? Got me revved up. Let's go. That's the natural view. The natural view says that the Bible is inspired in the same way that Shakespeare wrote his tragedies, the same way Homer wrote his Odyssey, or Muhammad the Quran. So in other words, the Bible is just a high level of human achievement written by gifted men, but not written by God. Now, you've heard people say that. That's called the natural view. That's what it's called. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. These two scriptures we're going to be, we will be intimately familiar with. <laughs> Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, that's an interesting verse. The, the focus of the verse is really up, in the, the, up, up with about the eyewitness and the more sure word. But when he says there of private interpretation, it doesn't come from a man sitting over in a closet writing it down, privately interpreting privately writing it out, okay? I know usually we say, well, you know, it's anyway, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I ought to make you guys memorize these two verses, but just be familiar with them, okay? So the, the natural view says, nope, it's just like Shakespeare when he was in the moment when he wrote the tragedies, or Homer, the, that's how the Bible came. What does Scripture say? That's not how the Bible came, okay? The second 
viewpoint. It's called a dynamic. Make sure I spell it right. Except my pen isn't working. A dynamic viewpoint, VP, viewpoint, okay? That is, is that the content and the concepts are what's important. Dynamic. You'll hear this, you'll hear that word used a lot around people talking about the scriptures. And when, especially when they begin to talk about translation, they'll say it's a dynamic translation. He's talking about that only the main thoughts of the paragraph is what's important. The dynamic viewpoint is just as long as we get the message across, then we're okay. Not the word. When you read the new Bible out there that's called the message, that's how that was, works. We're just going to get the thought across. We're just going to get it out there for people. We're not going to worry about it saying exactly what it needs to say. We're just going to get the concept and the ideas. So they, so they come along, and it, it's, we're just going to have the flow of thought, the thought flow be the issue. Okay? Then you have, you, you, any questions about those two? Okay, good. Quiet, quiet. The third theory is what's called partial inspiration. And it's just exactly what it means. Only certain passages of the Bible are inspired. So only certain parts of the Bible, and oh, by the way, those are the parts you deem important to you. So we're going to take the book and we're going to talk about brotherly love and the brotherhood of the Bible, of the, of the believer. So guess what parts of the Scripture are inspired? Not the ones about sin, hell, and death, and doom, and judgment. Those were just filler that the guys decided to put in there so that you would understand what the brotherhood and the love of the brotherhood is all about. You've heard that, haven't you? I have. So we're going to talk about love and brotherhood and oneness. Those parts are inspired. The good stuff are inspired. The bad stuff isn't. <laughs> Partial inspiration. Number next. This one is an interesting one. It's called Spirit Rule Only Viewpoint. That means that the Bible is, and it is only infallible. It's the only infallible rule of practice and faith in only matters of religion and ethics and spiritual matters. So when it comes to history or creation or scientific statements, it is not the absolute authority. Okay? The Scripture... The Bible is an infallible rule of practice and faith only in matters, only in areas of spiritual matters. Let's say it like that. Okay. But not in historical and scientific statements. So when the book says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that ain't true. But not in this viewpoint. <laughs> I know it's in our viewpoint, but it's not in their so when he says that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, that's histor history. That is not true. That is just a story to fill the pages so we can get over here to the spiritual issues. Follow that. Again, you've heard, you hear people talk like this. That's what it's called. Okay? So the spiritual rule only is an issue where the Scripture is the infallible rule in matters of spiritual matters only, not in historical and scientific statements. Did the flood happen? 
These guys say, no, it didn't. It's just a campfire story. You and I, we say it happened. She's arguing with me, and I'm on her side. <laughs> but, when <it> com- <laughs> but when it comes to, I'll leave that at home, okay? But when it comes to the religion and the ethics and morals, then the book is in, okay? Yep. The next one is an existential view. It says the only parts of the Scripture that are inspired are those parts that are true to the one and that speak to you. It's only relevant if it's speaking to you. It's called existential viewpoint. It's a viewpoint where when I read the book and it tells me that if I commit these, this, this, and this, then that, that does, that's not to me, it's not for me, it doesn't make me feel good. So I'm going to stick over here where it says that Jesus loved me and he wept for me and just pull in the feel-good stuff, okay? That's called the existential, ex, existential view. Now come over to Matthew 24. You guys with me? You see? Now again, you've heard, not the names, but the, the ideas. Well, there's the name. Now there's a sixth one. And the sixth one, Matthew 24, is where we need to go. The sixth one is Matthew 24. The sixth one is plenary, verbal inspiration. That's us. It says... Plenary, all verbal words are inspired. That's us. The plenary verbal says all the words are inspired by God. You will also hear it called verbal inspiration. Okay? Now, as we get into inspiration... This is who we are, but you will find out and notice as we go down the line that there's limit, there's inadequacies in this theory thought. That is honestly, when somebody asks me, are you a plenary verbal inspiration guy? I usually ask them, what do you mean by it? Because I know there's inadequacies because when the Lord says it is written and he goes and quotes the Old Testament and they're not identical, see a plenary verbal guy has got a problem because he says they should be identical. I'm talking about in the theory, okay? Rather than giving way to some of the issues that are in there of moving from one language to another, to you know, and stuff like that. Follow that? And we're going to talk about all that down the road in, in a greater... And I know I keep kicking it down the road because I don't want to bog down, I get through some of this introduction stuff, okay? And I don't want you to think that I don't recognize and are not aware of the inadequacies in this. But this one of the, the there's these six main theories, this one is, is where you and I are. If you look at Matthew 24, verse 35. Matthew 24 and verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my, what? Words shall not pass away. That's plenary verse. The words are the issue. That's the issue. This gentleman that asked me if I was this, I, I, we were, got to talking about it. I made him aware. I understand the inadequacies of it. I got that. But I am, the words are the issue. So if that m- matches what you're talking about, because see, he was here, but he was also up here at the dynamic stage too, okay? In, in, how, in the conversation, it was like, okay, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> you're a liberal when it comes to the book the Word of God, all right? So look over at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. Just a couple passages here on this. Again, we preach and teach from the plenary verbal verbal inspiration viewpoint. And we, I make no bones about it because what's the issue on the page? The words. The words are the issue. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man think himself... To be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I, what, write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What did Paul write? 
He wrote words down, and what does he say? The, these are scripture. The words on the page are the issue. Go, go back to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. That's why 2 Timothy 3.16, I began the morning, that's the key, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Because that's, where, that's, that's what it is. Now, Matthew 22 and verse, verse 31, but we're going to go back up a little bit. This, these, the, Matthew 22, 31 gives you the best definition of inspiration. Okay? So if you're looking for a verse to define inspiration, Matthew twenty two thirty one 31 is the verse. But I want you to go back up to verse 29 and just see the thought here that gets us to verse 31. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the what? The Scriptures, the writings, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they, may, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read? So if they're, if they're reading something, what are they reading? Words on the page. That which was spoken unto you by God saying. And then he goes and quotes Exodus chapter 3. Best definitions, verse 31. Look at that. What you are reading on those pages, by the way, it's a copy in the synagogue that they're reading. He called Scripture. There's a preservation. He says that's what God spoke back there and caused to be written down. So the thing to remember in all of our conversation, in all of our study here on inspiration, is that the men are not inspired. It's what's written down that's inspired. The words are. Again, 2 Peter 1, verse 21, holy men of God were moved. The issue here is the words. So when we talk about inspiration, we're talking about all the words. That's what we're talking about. That's why I say, if you, if you want to be in a camp, I don't like being in camps, but if you need to, you need to be in number six. <laughs> okay? Don't need to be off in the other ones because then you're a liberal concern when it comes to the Word of God. All right? You follow that? Okay. Now, come over. Let's talk. Let's get into some scriptures here of, on the inspiration. Folks, we're a people of, a, of the book. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter... Uh, actually, 1 Timothy 5. Let's just go there. We're a people of the book. So we should have a real strong conviction about the Word of God. And we should be able to support that conviction. And in the rest of this morning, and in an all in next month's seminar, the next one, the next three hours there, if not a few more, I want to drive home with you to where you can look at the book and have the conviction that the book you have in your lap is the Word of God to you in the English language, okay? And I do that not so that you, so that, you, know, you can go out there and win the argument. If you start arguing with these guys, you will lose, okay? Just have it for you. Have it so that you can help your family. Because I guarantee you, they might have heard of a few ideas, but they haven't heard of all that mess. And you go study that, you get in the books on that stuff, and you, you, it's me reading a medical journal upside down and backwards. It is like, huh? Okay? We need to know why we believe the Bible. We need to know what we believe about the Bible. That's why we're looking at verses. And we need to know where the Bible is. And we need to know what the Bible claims about itself. That's why 2 Timothy 3.16, I started with it. All The Bible says about itself that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's its claim. That's the claim that we make ourselves. 
we need to be able to back it up. Notice, if you will, by the way, as far as God is concerned, the whole Bible's inspired. <laughs> well, all Scripture is given by, he wrote, that's, what, that's his thought process, and I like his thought process, so we'll have that. Notice, if you will, 1 Timothy 5. Notice, if you will, verse 18. And, we're, and again, we're jumping into the context, we're jumping into doctrine, but I'm looking for you to notice what the book says about itself. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his word. Now, Paul is speaking here. Paul says, he's quoting Deuteronomy uh, 25, verse 4. That's the, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then he's quoting Luke 10, the labor is worthy of his word. By the way, you also find that in Matthew 10. I, I think it's Luke 10 that he's quoting more so that him and Luke were buddies. And Luke, he would have, he would have been piling around. Luke uses some, he uses, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you go study the gospel of Luke and you're studying Paul, Paul uses a lot of terms out of Luke. He really does. Well, but why? They were buddies. They hung out. They, Paul, Luke, as soon as Luke noticed the declension and the apostasy in, in mid-Acts there, in Acts 50, I'm talking about in the mid chapters of Acts, he doesn't go, he goes away from talking about Paul and Barnabas doing that until we did that. We went there. We, Luke gets in the trenches with Paul. It's amazing when you get to study Luke out. We're not doing that today, but the thing is, is what does Paul say? He calls both Deuteronomy and Luke what? Scripture. And when he does that, he ta he's talking about the, 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 the Scripture. Now, it's given, you're in 1 Timothy, just look back to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. That word scripture, the Greek word is our word graph. That's the Greek word, uh, okay? But what it means is to write something down. It's talking about the stuff that's written down, the scriptures. So the writings are what are inspired, the, the things that are written down. And again, it's not the writers. When Paul says and he quotes those passages, he didn't say, Moses said this, and he didn't say, Luke said this. He said, the Scripture said this, what's being written down. And when he, so when the Lord says, and Paul writes, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's what God is saying to man. It's not man getting the idea and then writing it down. Okay? So when we're discussing inspiration and we're talking about it, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the words on the page, all right? Now, say it again. We're talking about the words on the page. It's going to be the mantra. Now, come back with me to 1 Kings 13, and let's illustrate this out here about the issue here about the words on the page <clears throat> and not the writer. 1 Kings 13. Now, you can do this in your Old Testament really easy. You begin to see some of this happen. But in 1 Kings 13, this is an interesting passage here. And it's a prophecy about Jeroboam and his altar, verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, unto Jeroboam, stood by the altar to burn incense. So we're gonna, he's, he's, he's going to give a prophecy here about a man who's going to prophesy without, without ever foreseeing or knowing about what he was, going, what, what, what he was doing. He's just going to do it, and it's, and it's just blind. Look down at verse 7. Just read here. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Isn't that interesting? This is the young prophet here. He's just come up into the king, up, up to Jeroboam. Jeroboam says, you come home with me and be my, my, print, my priest. I'll give you a big old sign-on bonus. I'll give you a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou will give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. He leaves. 
But he doesn't go this, and through town. He goes the other direction, okay? Kind of catch what's going on here. Now watch verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. So now you got the old prophet. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. So the old guy goes after him. Now drop down to verse 18, just for time. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. He caught up to the young guy. Now the old guy, he's wearing all of the trappings all the garments, all the garb of the old prophet. The young guy, he just just getting started. The shine isn't even off his shoes yet. And he says, the old prophet says to the young, I'm just like you. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. See what the old man, did, the old prophet did? I got a word of the Lord. And he said, for you to come home with me. See that? But he never did, did he? Like, why? Just keep, it gets better. So he went back with him. Uh-oh. The young prophet, the word of the Lord to the young prophet was what? Don't go back. Don't eat bread. Don't drink the water. Do what I'm telling you to do, and then get out of town. The old prophet did what? Yay, God, did God really tell you to do that? Because he told me, you need to come back home with me. And it came to pass, verse 20, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Now, the old prophet's going to get a word here, and the old prophet's going to be scared to death because I don't think he ever got a word from the Lord. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place by, by the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten the bread and after he had drunk uh, and had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by. The lion also stood by the carcass. Look at what happened when you don't obey the word of God. <laughs> My point is, is that the old prophet never got a word. And then when he got a word, it scared him to death. And oh, by the word, the word came true. He said he had a word, but he lied. But when God gave him a word, it was a word of judgment. For doing what? For not having the word of God. Again, the issue, by the way, no... Notice that, verse 22. But camest back and sat and hast eaten bread and drunk water. He was told what? Eat no bread and drink no water. Was that a hard thing to do? That's why the thing in Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 was a disobedience to the Word of God. That's what it was. Come over to John 11. John chapter 11. The point, folks, is as an inspiration, the issue is going to be the Word, not the instrument. Because the Lord used the old prophet, who is a lying, scheming guy, to bring it in. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. It's interesting how when you go through Scripture and you study that the Lord uses different instruments. Remember... Balaam, Balak, and Baal, and the donkey. And the old, <laughs> they just talk, use that animal to tell him, you dummy. <laughs> you know? John 11, verse 49. Now, uh, well, let's start in verse 47. 
John eleven forty seven. 47, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. So they're gathered together. They're going to talk about killing the Lord is what they're talking about. All right? But keep reading. Verse 48, If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Now, they weren't worried about anything but losing their power. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, now, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, now watch, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for the nation only, but that he should also that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Notice what Caiaphas, he's the high priest. He's not worried about fulfilling scripture. He's worried about losing his power structure, but yet he does what? He prophesies. And in verse 51 and 52, the Holy Spirit's commentary, all of this prophesying that, that Caiaphas is talking about is about Jesus dying for Israel and for those scattered abroad, which, by the way, are the nation of Israel. They're not the body of Christ, but it's Israel. Now, the only way we understand that and know that from this passage is that verse 51 and 52 are written down for you to read that. Because if you just had verse 49 and 50, you would not understand what that meant. See how 51 starts? And this spake he not of himself. Here's the commentary. Here's the explanation of it. The Lord, by the way, the Lord does that. He does it several times. Come over, come over back to John 7. Just show you here another one quickly. John 7. John 7 and verse 37. In the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And we, they, you know, you hear them rah, rah, rah about that. Okay? But watch verse 39 and the parenthesis. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. If you didn't have verse 39, you know what you would think on coming out of verse 38? Is that coming out of the Lord was going to be this rivers of living water flowing and everything, and that's not what he's talking about. Who's he talking about? The Acts, the, the Acts 2, the Pentecostal, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit's poured out on, and a new covenant is introduced into a, a, a legitimate foretasting of it. See how, see how the Holy Spirit just, he just explains that for you in the parenthesis there? Now, if he didn't write that down, you wouldn't know it. You'd think he's talking about when the guy, when the, when the soldier gushes, uh, puts the spear in his side and the water and all that comes, you'd think that's flowing, liberal, flowing rivers of living water. See, there they are. They come, you know, and that's nothing. <laughs> Anyways, Psalms 33. When it comes to the Scripture, the words on the page are the issue. Psalms 33, verse 6. Psalms 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His now, there's natural revelation, which was authored in exactly the same way as written revelation has been authored. The what? The words of the Lord. The breath of His mouth. That's why you'll hear people say that inspiration is God-breathed. Because it did what? The breath of His mouth. That's where it comes from. So, when we talk... Come back to Mark 12. When we talk here about this and we're introducing it, God reveal. When you think about inspiration, it's, it's, 
they tried, I was sitting last night wrapping this up, and I was trying to figure out how to articulate this. When you think about inspiration, it's the words on the page. That's the issue. God literally reaches into the library of man's vocabulary. And he reaches in there in such a way that every word that they used in the writing were the very words God had determined that they would use in eternity past. Okay? Follow that. God never overrules the free will of man. He never does that. If he did, Adam and Eve would not have sinned. If he did... You think about, I think about Noah. I love Noah. Noah's such a good guy. But what if God says, Noah's going to rain? He goes, what's rain? God goes, well, it's like this, and dumps a cup of water on his head. You know, he didn't do that. But what if Noah had said, no, I'm not going to build the ark? We would have been reading about Jehu, who built the ark. See, God wouldn't have reached down there and made Noah do something that he wasn't, didn't Okay, now God reaches in and makes men do things, but it's usually 99.9999999% of the time associated with his word. When Paul says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened over there in Romans 9, how was Pharaoh's heart heart hardened? Because Moses brought the word of the Lord to him, and the word did the hardening. Because no because Pharaoh was rejecting the word. So God reaches into the library of man's vocabulary and uses the very words that he had determined in the eternity past to use. And this, I'll be honest with you, is where we have to account for the human element. And we have to take it into account the fact that God reaches into the library, the vocabulary of man, and their personalities, and their circumstances, and he writes out through, writes the words out through that. Okay? You got Mark 12? Flip back to Psalms. Just, I just, I'm sorry. I'm not, but I am. I haven't told you yet because I'm looking for it. Look at Psalms 18. Now, it might not be in your Bible because the printers, the publishers sometimes pull this stuff out, and it's a shame on them for doing it. In Psalms 18, right underneath Psalms 18 before verse 1, there's usually a, there should be a caption, Okay? And it says, to the chief musicians, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. All of that information there, it should be in your book. The publishers take that stuff out, and it's a shame. Because what that does, by the way, that Second Samuel... Uh, 20, okay? Because of that information, you understand the circumstance that David was in when he penned Psalms 18. So when God made him, caused him to write Psalms 18, the circumstances was that he was praising the Lord for delivering him from all of his enemies. Okay? That's the human element. That's why having those little things there is so wonderful, and it's really needed. And it's not so much there in the originals, but boy, what a great help it is when it comes down through time and those notes by the translators, and that's really where some of that stuff gets put in, okay? Now come back to Mark 12. So we have to take into account that the Lord is going to use men, their personalities, their circumstances, their vocabulary. Think about Matthew. He writes the gospel that portrays the Lord as a king. Who was he? He was was a a tax collector for the Roman government. He was hated by his own people because he sided with Rome. So he's a government official. He's used to looking at governmental documents. 
So therefore, he writes how? As a governmental official, as a government thinker. Well, he's promoting him as king. Who's the king? The head of the government. So he uses that. You understand that. You have pens. You guys taking notes? Each pen writes a little different, doesn't it? You use a ballpoint pen, writes different than, well, I didn't bring my fountain pen. I have a fountain pen. I love my fountain pen. But it writes thicker and broader. It's writing the same words. It's just writing differently. Use a pencil. Pencil is different than a pen. That's the idea, okay? So the different characteristics of the instruments that is doing the writings, again, as God dictates the words to him, as he gives them, but God is responsible for the words that are recorded, not the man. All right, long way around to saying that, I guess. This is God's book, and it's what God said, and when we're dealing with it, we're dealing with the Lord. So when you're going to deal with the Lord, you, got to, you have to deal with that book that way. You've got to think about it, okay? Now watch Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark 12. You guys with, you understand what we're talking about? I'm just, again, introducing, trying to get you thinking about it. Mark 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said, by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou, said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until, uh, until I make th thine enemies thy footstool. Notice, he's quoting Psalms 110.1, okay? But Jesus says what? Jesus says that when David wrote Psalms 110, he did it by who? He did it by the Holy Ghost. So Christ says, it's not the men, it's what was written down, that's the issue. Look over at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Here's Peter. Jesus Christ is the big guy. Here's Peter, he's the second big guy. Here's Peter, Acts 1 verse 16. Now Peter's going to be quoting Psalms 41. Men and brethren, Acts 1 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Who spoke it? The Holy Ghost did. Who wrote it down? David did. Peter says that's Scripture. Who did the writing? David's the human instrument, but the Holy Ghost is the one giving him the words to write down. Come over to Acts 28. In verse 25, here's Paul. We got the three big ones, if you haven't noticed. We got the Lord, we got Peter, and now here's Paul. Acts 28, 25. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. And he quotes Isaiah 6, verse 10. What does Paul say? Paul says, Holy Spirit's the writer. Isaiah is the instrument as he writes Isaiah 6. So when we're dealing with Psalms 110, Psalms 41, Isaiah 6, we're dealing with what God wanted recorded down. Not what David thought would be po poetry for the moment. Not what Isaiah was trying to fill in the blanks, trying to figure this stuff out. That goes, you know, that passage in Peter where they searched it diligently to know what was going on. P Isaiah didn't say, well, you know what, I think this is what he's talking. No, the Holy Ghost comes in and he moves, come over to Hebrews chapter 3, and he works with the man, the human author. There's some 40 plus human authors of Scripture. Hebrews 3, the writer of Hebrews is God. We don't know the human instrument, but the writer is who? God. First word of chapter 1, verse 1, God. But look at verse 7, Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, 
Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the temptation of the wilderness. And he keeps quoting Psalms 95 down to verse number, the end of verse number 11. But notice how the parenthesis started. As the Holy Ghost did what? Say. So you come back there to Psalms 95, (laughs) and you begin to look at this, and you go, well, who wrote Psalms 95? Well, let's go look. Well, look at there. There's nobody's name on Psalms 95. Doesn't say Psalm of David. It doesn't say, it just says Psalms 95. So who wrote Psalms 95? Hebrews 3, verse 7 says the Holy Ghost did. Now, in the Psalms, when you come to those guys, you have to remember the, the, the men of Hezekiah, because they were great instruments used in collecting and gathering together the book of Psalms, collating it, putting it together over time, okay? My point is, is Hebrews 3, verse 7 helps you understand who wrote Psalms 95, which is who? The Holy Ghost. Doesn't have, we don't, Hebrews, no human author mentioned Psalms 95, no human author mentioned, but the writer is the Holy Ghost, okay? It's human too, but it's because somebody wrote it, we just don't know who, because we have it. Now, come back over to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's do this one, and then we'll mark it, and then we'll pick up here next time, okay? I better mark it, shouldn't I? (laughs) Yeah, it would be good, huh? Notice, if you will, 2 Peter 1. We'll start in verse 16. Verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in your remembrance. Boy, Peter says the same thing Paul says. Man, my time's here. Just preach the word. Just remember. You know, the Lord give the understanding. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Verse 16, For we have not followed. Here's the things Peter wants you to remember. We have not followed cunning devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. Now, that's Matthew 17, the Mount Transfiguration, okay? What does Peter say? When we were on that mountain, baby, we saw this. We were eyewitnesses of this account, and we heard him. Now, watch verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do dwell, do well that ye have take that ye take heed as unto the light shineth into a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now go back to verse nineteen. Now think about what Peter's saying. I'm dying, and what I want you to remember is that when when we saw the glory of of the Son and we saw the kingdom glory out there, we were eyewitnesses of it. We saw it, we heard everything, but there's a more sure, surety, because an eyewitness account can do what? It can be off, can it? We had a bus accident at the at the job. The driver said this. The video showed something else. Oh, whoops, is right. The witnesses that saw the accident described nothing like the driver described. Nothing like, so everybody's like, what do we do now? (laughs) Well, 
it's always the driver's fault in the bus accident because of the CDL laws and rules. And unless you go fight it in court, does it not really go away? Why? Because a CDL is a commercial driver. You're professionally trained. You ought to know what you should never have gotten yourself into that situation. Problem is, is the driver's eyewitness account is from what vantage point in the accident? He's behind the wheel. Everybody else, see how you got, Peter says, me and James and John were up on that hill, and baby, we saw it. We saw Elijah, we saw Moses, we saw the Lord, we built them altars, we had us a cookout, we did everything. But you know what? There's a more sure word of prophecy. There's something in the word of God that is going to outweigh our eyewitness, and you need to take heed to it and be aware of it. So therefore, verse 20 has got a context about the private interpretation, doesn't it? You see, it doesn't have its own interpretation. It wasn't my idea, guys. It wasn't, my, it wasn't me and James and John colluding together to write the report in such a manner that promoted the, sun, the glory of, of the kingdom. What promotes it? The Word of God did that, the sure word of prophecy. You see how this, it's that issue of the Word, man, the words. And it came because God told him to write it down. And the, origin, the, the origination of the Scripture is God Himself, it's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, where He Himself moved the men to, to write down the very words that He wanted written down. Okay? Now, it's noon. See that? It's noon. Okay? The very, when we talk about inspiration, we're talking about the words, not the men. Okay? So that will tell you, that's okay. That's all right. That'll tell you that when you hear somebody say that the King James translators were inspired, then you would just go, what? <laughs> Thanks for playing. Okay? The King James translators were men. They were not inspired men. We're going to look at them. We'll, I'll give you their history. There's, you know, a bunch of them. What that comes from is guys postulating out of all these viewpoints. Now, we're going to pick up, we'll pick up here. I'll give you another set of references, and we'll, I, I got like 30 or 40 verses we're going to run down through, but we'll, do, we'll start doing that next week, Okay. All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for your, the scriptures, that we have them, that we can trust them. We know where they're at. And as we're studying this topic and looking at it, that we would do so just, just with our hearts open to what your word says about itself. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for everything that's said and done. In your name we pray. Amen.